Well, welcome to everyone to uh, the Iowa City City Council work session for Tuesday, April 6. As you know, we are um, on a new time zone, 4 p.m. And so we will be starting all of our meetings just one hour earlier. So um, 4 p.m. will be our work session and 6 p.m. will be the start of our formal meetings. We are on the first item for our work session, which is a process for interviewing city attorney applicants. And so um, counselors, as many of you know, um, today is actually Eleanor's last meeting uh, with us, um, work session with us, because her last day will be on the 16th of April. And so um, certainly wanted to, um, invite her to be a part of this conversation um, because I think she can offer us something here. Um, but, and also wanted to say thank you to Eleanor uh, who was hired by the city in uh, 1996. Don't be doing the math because people try to do math and add up some stuff. But she was uh, March 18th, 1986, she was hired to be the assistant city manager, uh, I'm sorry, city attorney. And then, uh, September 29th, 1997, she was appointed as the city manager. And so thank you for all of your services that you've given to the city. We are so appreciative for all that you've done. And even though it's COVID, we send big hugs and we say thank you. And even though this is your last meeting, I know that you're a part of our great city. Um, and you'll continue to be a part of the work that we do at the city, even after you're gone. So thank you so much for all that you've done. Thank you. Yes. And then we are going to dive into the conversation about interviewing city attorney applicants. The applications are uh, for this position, are they're all due by April 15th. And so there's two things that we wanna talk about. One would be the review of the applications and the second would be the interview process. So for the review of the applications, currently uh, Councilor Burgess and Mims and I are, uh, we were kind of the, uh, the ad hoc group <laughs> of the counselors that is working with the uh, city manager um, to kind of go through the application. Um, we posted the applications and, and, and did that, uh, review that information for the applications. And now once the applications come in, um, we just need to talk about how, how would council like us to review those applications and kind of elevate the ones of interest uh, to engage in an interview process. So right now we do have three of us appointed and I wonder if um, council would entertain us three working alongside with Jeff to kind of thumb through the applications and then, you know, kind of figure out uh, the ones that we want to bring for interview for interview. And I think that's where the, you know, where we, if, if council it's comfortable with that, or if there's another counselor that wants to be a part of that process, I think we certainly can talk about that right at this moment. I know Councilor Mims has, has served on uh, uh, committees like this before, because I've done one of them with her uh, for this uh, clerk. So I would be interested to see, I mean, that's kind of the process we used. You could have sifted through the applications that you had and narrow it down to a certain number uh, of the ones you think are the best qualified and then they go proceed from there with interviews and not necessarily interview uh, all of the applicants, unless maybe you only have two or three applicants. I don't know how many you have, but I'd be curious to see what Councillor Mims has to say. Yeah, I think, Colleen, I think that is a reasonable way to start is for with the city manager and with a group of the three of us to do a preliminary look through all the applications and kind of narrow those down. And certainly um, if we have trouble narrowing down or if there's issues in terms of numbers, too many, too few, we can certainly, um, you know, come back to the full council. But I would um, hopefully envision the three of us, along with maybe some guidance from Jeff of 
narrowing that down to a pool that then we would all look at and out of that pool decide who we wanted to bring in for interviews. I, I would certainly want to bring back to the full council um, more than just who we think we might want to interview. I think the whole council needs to be involved in kind of that second narrowing down. Do you all have any idea of the of like criteria that you're looking for? Is it basically going to be a, a sort of look at, see what you get in and see, um, and then see what looks like a good fit for the city based on the, a bit based on the, um, the request that you put out to, to pull in applications? Well, we've got the job description and I haven't looked at it in quite a while, but typically, and uh, you know, you've got your minimum criteria and your desired. And obviously I think, I know personally, I would be, you know, hoping we would find somebody with uh, city attorney experience, um, if not at the highest level, it's certainly um, an assistant at a decent sized city, somebody who's got that municipal law um, experience, I think would be, certainly would be a real positive to me. So yeah, we'll just have to go from there. Yeah. Elmer, could I ask you briefly what, what you think are some of the most important attributes going forward? Was that a question to me? Oh. Um, well, I, I think as I've always told you, I, I, I mean, obviously, I think the, the job app application sets out the minimum um, qualifications and as well as the preferred qualifications, which, which would be in, I think it says in-house um, uh, city attorney for five years, uh, but it could also be someone who's had substantial municipal practice in a, in a private practice. I, I think that's, that's hard, hard to find. Um, but after that, you know, I, I think that um, I think it's good you have two um, lawyers in the group of three because I think I think as a lay person it's a difficult thing to evaluate a, a lawyer. Um, but I think you know there's things about lawyers that um, will speak to you, whether they have recommendations from people who are respected within the legal community, um, what kind of reputation they have in the legal community, and the um, whether they provide timely advice, um, whether um, they've had experiences that require them to do complex problem solving, um, preferably in areas that they're going to encounter um, at the city. Um, so, I mean, really, it's just kind of the whole package. Obviously, you want to have someone that you feel like you can relate to, too. Um, you know, I would caution you for looking for flashy and that kind of thing in a lawyer. I don't think it, you really need that in a lawyer. Um, you just need a solid, s smart, they, they, you know, they just need to be really, they need to be smart and they need to be um, and they need to be willing to work as part of a team um, and realize that there are that there are many things that the council and staff members are trying to, to figure out and um, and it's just I think I said in the art it's just trying to figure out what the possible solutions are and then taking those to the policymakers to decide what what course they want to pursue. Thanks. I, first, I would like to thank you, Eleanor, for your service across the years. And, uh, you know, just wish you the best for your retirement. Thank you. And I, I just think that you, you since you've been uh, like our city attorney for long times, you know the challenges and like everything that our city went through uh, do you think you can write some questionnaire for uh, like when we interview the people, if you can just write some kind of question that it will guide us to interviews, you know, the, the person, like some uh, challenges question that you think we should ask 
the applicant. Since you know what's the, the, the thing that's really happening in our city and you know some challenges yeah. that you, you think it is good to ask that question to the person. So well, I, I have know, a, I have a list for... I have a list of um, you know questions that I've used over the years when I hire assistant city attorneys and I'm not sure the questions would necessarily I mean there might be some. Um, obviously, that, that would need to be amplified, but a lot of the questions are probably good questions for a city attorney um, as well, so I can certainly share those. Yes, please. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful, and I, I, I would agree with Mayor Pro Tem that uh, just reviewing what you already have and just uh, coming from uh, some of the comments that you talked about, the attributes of what we should look for. Now, of course, there is the HR proper questions that we have to ask. And of course, this uh, you know, um, be ran by Karen, um, the interview questions or have involvement from our HR department. But I, I would agree, I think that would be kind of good for you to review and because um, you do have a vantage point that us lay folks <laughs> don't have. Uh, of course, I, I do appreciate this process with having uh, two attorneys on on staff and then of course um we can't not discount the 12 years of service that councilor mems have also provided for us so yeah yeah but no, I think i'll, I'll share I'll, I'll send those questions to to jeff um if that works for you all yeah and i also have to say that we're pretty fortunate because we have some um, some labor people you know uh uh councilor teller and and mayor pro tem i mean these are people that you know work with workers, myself included, right? <laughs> I, I hire people. So the good thing is that we do have some, I think we have a great team to kind of review some stuff. And even Councillor Thomas has worked in you know the municipal uh, arena uh, in his professional life. So yeah, this would be great just to, as a team to work through this. And I, and. And unless there's any more comments about this, then uh, it's, if everyone is in agreement that um, Burgess and Mims and I will shift through the applicants, bring them back to the full council, uh, which I'm assuming that we'll have to have an executive session for. You, you, you I mean, cities do it different ways. I think typically um, Iowa City has done it where the whole council as opposed to a subcommittee does the interviewing. And obviously that has to occur in executive, it doesn't have to occur in executive session, but it typically does. And the, um, the applicant needs to, Kelly knows this process, the applicant needs to request a closed session. I guess maybe we should, you know, discuss that at this point, if we're talking about the interview process, what do people, what are people's thoughts? I think what Eleanor just said of the interviews happening with the full council, but probably in closed session, if that's what the applicant requests, makes sense to me. Once we, okay. so the three of us read all the applications, provide a initial um, list that we anticipate would be more than those that we would interview, council as a whole can select a few to interview and then we conduct those interviews. Okay, well, great. What about timeline? Applic applicants close on the 15th and then when would um, council like those to be completed by? And I guess maybe this is something that we can uh, coordinate our schedules offline with the three that is gonna do the application review in the, with the city manager. But would it be, um, so the 15th is next Thursday. So then if we gave ourselves. Um, at least a week or two to shift through those and then get that to the council the first Tuesday in in May. I'd like 
to see us try and get through them in a week if we can. I mean, it'll, it'll depend on numbers, but I'd like to see the three of us try and get through that first round uh, within a week and then be able to um, send our recommendations for that pared down list to council and then maybe a, a week or less to then kind of determine our finalists that we would bring in for interviews. I don't know if that well, seems reasonable to people. So, and, so, and if there aren't very many applications, would how, how would I mean? I know that in, in that sometimes we have to go back out and as we did with police chief and ask and prolong the the search period a little bit. Is there is there sort of a threshold for that, or is that just based on who you get? regardless of how small the applicant pool is? I think it's based on who we get. I mean, if we, even if it's a really small applicant pool, but we have somebody in there that we think is very qualified and would really be the right fit, I don't see the reason to prolong the process um, and drag it out. But we could have a huge applicant pool and not have anybody that we think is we're comfortable with is the right fit and we'd still need to go back out. So I think it just depends on the quality of the applicants and we'll have to see once we start reviewing those. I think your, your application period has been sufficiently long. If you've got attorneys who are looking for this kind of position, my guess is they'll be tuned into it. So it sounds like we, the, the proposal right now is for the week of the 19th. Um, we'll review the applications and then the week of the 26th, submit the recommended applications, applicants to the full council. And then May 4th, we'll have to review our work session <laughs> agenda. Um, but if we can get that on that work session agenda, Mayor Pro Tem and I, along with the city manager, will review that and then um, we can go into a, a session on that day. Does that sound okay? All right, great. Anything else? Well, thank you again, as the city attorney, Eleanor. And we hope that, um, this the the start of a 4 p.m. You're a part of this historic moment here in our city. No, so. you finally do it after 25 years. You're starting at four. I know. I almost <laughs> forgot today. I'm like, oh my goodness, it's four o'clock. Yes. <laughs> so well, at least you can say you were a part of it, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Part of the change. <laughs> yeah. So thank you again for all that you've done. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the next agenda item, which is dis discuss capital improvement plan and mark plan for Market and Jefferson one way to two way conversion project. And that is um, on the IP3. I don't remember which date. I believe that was the second one that we had. Mayor, would you like me to do a brief intro for this item? Yes, please. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Uh, so in your information packet on the first, I uh, included a, a background memo and then shared a copy of an email that I had previously sent to you uh, when we had some public comments about uh, the removal of the market in Jefferson uh, project. So, so that uh, between the, that email and the um, memo, uh, hopefully we answered uh, most of your uh, questions. We do have staff here to uh, answer some questions tonight. The, the short recap is um, that the Market Jefferson two-way project was first identified in the downtown streetscape plan back in 2013. Uh, we then did some, some traffic studies uh, to better understand um, how that project might um, function uh, both on Market and Jefferson and in some of the surrounding streets where traffic could be pushed. Um, we had a preliminary budget of 500,000, uh, which is, is pretty consistent for um, conversion costs uh, when it's really just focused on, mostly on uh, restriping a road. 
Um, as we, as we do every year, we review the CIP projects and as projects get closer, we take a little bit deeper dive into the, into the, uh, the design, try to anticipate uh, what, might, uh, what other changes might be needed. And in this one, uh, the more we got into it and started looking at the condition of the, of the traffic signals, which are probably 1970s vintage, um, we felt like uh, it would be appropriate to um, replace those traffic signals. Uh, uh, one, to just improve functionality and, and, and better accommodate pedestrian movement along the corridor, but knowing that the life of a traffic signal isn't gonna extend much beyond 50 years either. Uh, we're currently probably right around that 50 year, year mark right now. That pushed the project cost uh, up to um, at least the estimate up to about 2.6 million. So about a $2 million increase when you have to replace all the signals. And when you're getting to the, into that work, you, you're doing a lot of curb ramp work as well. So the, the project scope ballooned quite a bit. And uh, uh, I think council's aware that um, and we do have uh, limited resources in the CIP. We have um, some bonding limits that we, we try to stay true to, to, to keep our tax rate stable. And uh, that increase just wasn't able to be accommodated without dropping what, what staff felt would be uh, more impactful projects uh, in the community. Um, so we removed that uh, from uh, that project from the CIP and uh, really focused on keeping other projects uh, that were contemplated um, in, in the CIP uh, uh, and, and not delaying anything further that we felt was, was super critical. Um, so a, a couple of things I'll, I'll uh, mention, um, just because we, we moved it out doesn't mean that that, that corridor doesn't get looked at anymore. Um, in our road resurfacing uh, efforts this year, we'll, we'll focus on Jefferson Street. So we'll do some pavement improvement. We'll take that opportunity to restripe the bike lanes and, and make those a little bit wider, uh, put some buffer onto those, uh, which should have uh, some, some effects on, on uh, the traffic calming as well as just making it more a comfortable bike um, uh, bike lane on that street. And then next year for resurfacing, we'll give Market Street a good hard look to and see if that rises to the top to where we can do some, some interim improvements on market. Um, outside of that project, I thought it'd be helpful just to give you a little bit more background on, on the changes made to a CIP uh, in, uh, from year to year. So also in, in your work session is a kind of a differential report or a change summary. And you can go through and you can see every uh, CIP project and, and how it changed from last year to, to the currently adopted CIP that you just approved last month. Um, you'll notice most projects experience some change, whether it's a dollar amount estimate uh, or a uh, movement forward a year, backward a year, uh, removal from the CIP, or, or in some cases, new additions to the CIP. Um, uh, it's quite a bit of work that goes into to putting that CIP together. And uh, we have to look at things like the urgency of the need. Sometimes we think, you know, something may last another four or five years, and all of a sudden, it has to be replaced on a more urgent basis, or, or uh, contrarily, we'll get some more life out of out of pavement or a park playground than we thought we would. Uh, and then as we experienced with this project on an extreme level, oftentimes um, we'll more closely evaluate scope and the price will go up or down uh, based, on, uh, based on that uh, refined analysis. So that report's in there. Um, we can answer any questions you have about uh, those changes and how staff compiles our recommendations to you. Um, if you are looking to add that project, uh, that Market Jefferson project back into the CIP, uh, we'll need some direction from you on not only kind of a year to target that in, it's not possible for us to, uh, to, to pull that together now. I think it was scheduled for next year previously, um, but we'll probably need to be looking at a couple of years out uh, so that we can get uh, an engineer working with us. Um, but we'll also need some guidance on, on just how to fund that and whether you know you want us to identify projects to cut and bring those to you or if you'd like to do that um, as, a, as a council. So again, we have uh, our engineering and planning staff here to answer any questions that you have. Uh, hopefully uh, the uh, work session uh, packet items helped get in front of some of those questions. Yep, can I ask you, 
a question. How is the condition of the road? Um, I'll leave that to uh, if we have uh, Ron or Jason on the call, um, who's probably more closely looked at that condition. I would say overall it's in decent condition. We, we did identify at least a portion of Jefferson Street that we would, that we're planning to overlay this year. Um, we were planning to take a, a closer look at Market Street for next year. So I, I mean, I think they're in okay condition. It, it's probably getting to the point that at least portions of them are gonna need some attention, but I think overall um, they're probably not in terrible condition. Is there is some uh, street in town, they are in a worse condition than, than those two streets? I, I would say yes, there are. In a uh, bad condition, I mean? Yeah, I, I, it's certainly not, the, those two streets are not the, the worst condition that we have around town. Um, I would note that the estimate that we included doesn't really address street condition. It's more signals and curb ramps and that kind of stuff, but um, to answer your question, no, I, I would not put these in the, the lowest category as far as condition. Well, I'll, I'll kind of be the elephant in the room here and, and talk a little bit about this, because um, I have to admit, I, I was disappointed when I uh, found out uh, that through word of mouth that it had been pulled from the CIP. Uh, because it seemed as though when we initially discussed this, it had strong support even by the downtown district and the neighborhood, surrounding neighborhood, uh, the council and, and other folks. Uh, so I, I, I thought it was a go. And I, I'm remembering that past precedent ha has been set on this as far as uh, increasing estimates on projects. I'm thinking in particular Pet Mall, which of course was necessary, the changes were necessary, but that skyrocketed almost double the initial cost that was in the CIP, but instead it was modified and left in the CIP. Uh, so I, I can only see this project as, as getting even more expensive. You're talking about the, the signals, but somewhere in your info, you said uh, if, if we're doing two-way signals, they would have to be different than what you would put in for one-way signals. So we certainly wouldn't want to put the one-way signals in there and then have to turn around when we do convert it to two-way and do two-way signals. That would just seem not not right, um, but so I would I would just say and encourage that as soon as possible. If you're saying now it can't be 2021 or 2022, obviously, uh, as soon as possible after 2022 uh, and 2023, we need we need to look at getting it in the CIP and getting it done because there seems to be a lot of support out there and our surrounding communities, Des Moines and Cedar Rapids, they've all found that it's kind of an archaic thing to have one ways, and they've they've been uh, slowly eliminating their one way. So I just think we need to follow suit and, and do that. Yeah, if I could uh, um, just add on to that a little bit, um, we certainly would not. I think when we when we remove this project, our thought would be that when the time comes to replace those signals, that that would be the time to look at this. Um, what we didn't want to do is is go in and spend uh, a little bit of money now, and then five, ten years from now, go go back in and and have to redo um, redo anything uh, or undo anything. So. Um, yes, you're right. When those signals need to get replaced, I think that's the time we, we would do it. And we, we've done a lot of these conversions over the last few years. I think we've been pretty pretty good at, at pursuing um, uh, some of these uh, uh, one-way to two-way conversions. We agree. Um, it's, it's not a disagreement on the, that the project needs to be done. It's, it's, a, it's a question of urgency. Um, and, and, you know, unlike the, the PedMall project, which, you know, had to address some really core infrastructure underneath. This is one that the, the urgency isn't there, um, at least in, in, in our particular view as staff, uh, compared to some of the other CIP projects where you have really failing conditions on major roadways or some uh, park improvements that, that have what we feel are some more critical updates. But just to be clear, staff still supports the project. We just didn't see a way to, to fit it into the puzzle of the CIP given the, the cost increase. Jeff, can you remind me, is this gonna be a one-way to two-way conversion on the entire length of Market and Jefferson or just near the downtown area? 
Yeah, it, it would be the entire length, except we're, we're not sure that um, how it would work uh, west of Clinton uh, as you get into the university campus. There may be good reason to keep that one way, uh, given the really high volumes of, of pedestrian crossing uh, there at the Cleary Walkway. Uh, but the idea would be that it would be the entire, the, the entire way. I've never been real supportive of this and I, I, I can understand staff's position, but I think when the broader community sees this moving forward, I think you need to be prepared for an incredible amount of pushback. I don't think many people even know this is on our radar. Um, on the north side, you know, when you look at traffic flow, there's, there's not, we've got, you know, major arterials on the south side and you've got Burlington going through the center and it makes it a whole lot easier for people. As I've mentioned to people, this might happen. They're like, oh no, they can't imagine it. And I would certainly agree with you, Jeff, that uh, once you get into the campus, I think having it two way on those hills that go down to the river is inviting potential disaster in the winter. I mean, I've seen people slide down Market Street Hill. Uh, I personally have been in situations of trying to get up Jefferson Street and having to back down because you can't get up and see other cars do the same. So to have those two really steep hills two way, I think is going to be problematic. And I think, um, I think when the word really gets out to the broader community, um, I think just, I think council and staff that are here at the time need to be prepared for a lot of pushback. I'll give a few a few thoughts, trying to provide a little bit of context on this. Um, you know, I did look at the the streetscape master plan in terms of uh, its implementation and what were prioritized in that master plan. And uh, what was said there was that generally speaking, the highest priority projects are those that address safety and public infrastructure needs. And uh, Market Street and, and the the focus, I think, in the downtown streetscape master plan was on the commercial activity portions of it. Uh, Market Street was identified as one of the four streets in the priority one category. So it, it was identified as a high priority. Uh, the downtown district advocacy statement in September of 2019 under access and mobility felt that the, the change would uh, be critical to the success of the retail neighborhood and Northside Marketplace. Uh, so, so we have those two entities, you know, those two reports uh, suggesting that it's, it's a high priority project. Um, I think it's important to think about Market and Jefferson in the notion of repairing what, what might be called the, you know, the connected network of streets in the core of Iowa City, the gridded connected network. And, and the the damage that the one ways do in terms of that sense of connection. Um, and in part, you know, we've talked about the speeding, right? It's, um, you know, two multi-lane one ways do accelerate traffic speeds. You know, there's a tendency when you're driving on multi-lane one ways to jockey from one lane to the other, depending upon where the gaps are. So the speeds tend to be higher. Um, they also have an impact on adjacent property values. You know, I think we can all sense of how, you know, if, if one lived or had a business on a street where there was high speed traffic, uh, that that would degrade the quality of life of those adjacent properties. And I've talked to many people uh, about that. And that's, you know, that's what I hear, you know, John, please, when are we going to be converting our one way systems because of the impacts they have on, on the adjacent properties. Um, the, another issue is the convenience. Um, it's the one ways tend to be uh, confusing. Uh, they can force circuitous routes when you're trying to get from one place to another. Um, we have a lot of traffic uh, that tends to go the wrong way on the one ways. Uh, I talked to a, a a clerk at uh, John's Grocery not too long ago and said, what do you see uh, at, at your corner there? You know, John's is at the corner of Gilbert and Market. And he said he sees uh, a car going the wrong way about once an hour during his time there. 
And, and we see it all the time. All of us have seen that. And that, that has to do with the connectivity and I think the expectation of pe what people have uh, given the size of Iowa City, you know, that, that the one ways, and I think in part it's because we are beginning to, to you know, block by block, um, reduce the, the presence of the one ways. Uh, but there isn't an expectation, certainly with visitors, that a city like Iowa City would have one way traffic. Uh, so there is, you know, that issue as well. And then I would say the other, the other factor would be, you know, following up on our conversations over Black Lives Matter, uh, one way streets don't self regulate, you know, they, they do require more policing, because of the, the fact that people do drive at higher speeds. There are drivers who, who fail to understand that, um, you know, we have them in the first place. And so they do require um, more policing. And then of course, if there is a collision, responding to the collisions. Um, as, as Pauline was saying, they, they and, and this, this is what I find interesting, is you do find cities and our, our neighbor to the north, Cedar Rapids, they converted their entire downtown. That was, that was their high priority. Let's convert all our, our, our grid network in the downtown from one way to two way. And they started that in 2015. Uh, but there are other, and, and the, I have a quote here from Jennifer Pratt, who is their development director. These two way conversions are a critical piece to make it feel like a place where you want to live and walk, walk around and feel safe. So that if, if we value safety, both for vehicular travel, pedestrian travel and bicycle travel, it, you know, many cities have taken the position that it's a very important strategy to, to bring the streets back to two-way traffic as soon as possible. Uh, some other cities in Iowa uh, that have done this would be Davenport, or planning or have completed conversions would be Davenport, Des Moines, Indianola, Muscatine, Dubuque. So it's, it's a very popular strategy. Uh, South Bend, Indiana is a national strategy uh, Pete Buttigieg, when he was mayor of South Bend, uh, did something similar to um, the, the downtown streets there uh, as Cedar Rapids did. And um, I, I think it was in part the work that he did in South Bend that uh, gave him the, the opportunity to serve as U.S. Secretary of Transportation. Um, so my feeling is, is that, you know, I've been kind of waiting for this project. I felt, you know, given the way in which the, um, the master plan called for priority, safety is priority one, uh, that with the exception of some intersections, we weren't really looking at the corridors that in my view are the most dangerous and that really do disrupt the character and feeling of the downtown area. Um, so, so from my standpoint, I was kind of patiently waiting while we were going through these projects. And as Pauline said, some came in uh, higher than was expected. And I said, all right, um, fine. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing the one ways converted. Uh, so um, I would also note that the, the cost over, you know, the, the, this additional cost is not for aesthetic enhancements, it's for replacing the signalization and the curb ramps and the signals, uh, you know, are arguably already in a deferred maintenance status at this point, um, being that they were installed in the 70s. Some of the potential funding sources that I was looking at, and this obviously would take some time uh, to consider would be, um, we have a curb ramp annual fund. We also have a traffic signal annual fund that could be drawn from. And uh, one project that I walked over the last few days was Fairchild Street from Clinton to Lynn, the two block segment on uh, both sides of Dubuque. Uh, that's a $1.4 million project. Um, you know, it's, it, yes, it's not in great condition, but none of the brick streets are, are in really great condition. It's, it seemed Lynn Street may be in worse condition than Fairch, uh, Fairchild. 
just based on my observation. Um, so that might be one to consider and see if there are ways we can repair what needs to be repaired and and hold off on the wholesale replacement um, of either one or both blocks. Um, and I'm sure there are more, um, but those were some that you know I just looked at uh, quickly uh, before the work session today. I got disconnected earlier. I was asking my questions. Uh, you know, I still going to ask the same questions. I, I get the first one, but the second one I ask is there is another street. They said the street are in decent condition. Is there is another street in town that really in a bad condition that we need to repair? If you can give me an answer to that question. Yeah, if you think uh, back to the work session we had in March when we reviewed the, the street conditions, we have a, a great number of streets that are in worse conditions than this. Um, but again, the, this, this was really not trying to solve the street condition. It was trying to s solve the, the traffic circulation and pedestrians circulation. Um, but you're, it's the same funding source. Uh, so if, if pavement condition is a higher priority, Yes, this th these streets would not be at the top of the list in terms of, you know, what's what's in worse condition in Iowa City. Okay, Jeff, can you remind me what's the source of the fund normally for uh, like uh, streets? Yeah, we would either do general obligation bonds or road use tax um, in a project like this. Um, we would probably look at that uh, um, traffic signal account too. That's a fairly minor account. We have about 150,000 a year in that account. So that's a, you know, that's not even quite a complete intersection uh, there. That's less than an intersection would cost. That tends to be an account where we accumulate it for a couple of years and then we, we, uh, we, we, we spend it. Um, but you're either looking at general obligation bonds or road use tax. And, and how much is will cost if we wanna convert both of them? Um, right now, our estimate is 2.6 million. 2.6 million. Yeah. Uh, I understand what John and Bullion saying, but if there is, you know, if uh, Iowa City residents, all of them are taxpayer, and there is some street even like uh, in a bad condition, then those two street that I guess run and uh, said is in decent condition. I think we need to focus for all Iowa City, not only like certain street for the people just because of uh, like, I don't even what the reason for doing it right now uh, for traffic and whether it is like circulation of traffic or whether this is will benefit the, you know, some business around the area or uh, I, I really don't know what the reasons right now. But I think there is many streets in bad condition. I even, I, I, I know certain streets that I will drive on and it's really in bad condition and need our attention. I'm not agonizing like converting this, is, uh, you know, whatever the reason is, but it's not the time for it. I believe we need to focus on the street that's really in a bad condition. Uh, you know, it is really interesting that we just like, you know, the payment that getting higher and that's concerning us and black life matter and that's concerning us for all this. You know, by the way, affordable housing also is a big thing that we never move forward on it. And houses getting, you know, really higher every year. If we don't like really have affordable housing, it's still, we, you know, since we get higher. I hope the same mentality that we use for this, we use it when we talk about affordable housing and try to find fund uh, for them too. We haven't done a lot, you know, for a long time, we, didn't, we did not move. I don't wanna say we haven't done, but we did, but we need to do more in uh, certain areas. This is three, it's look decent for now. And I think we need to look, if we just talking about the street, we need to give the priority for the other streets that really need to be fixed. And, and when the time come for it, for this one, we can do it. I just support the staff decision on this. Thank you. 
Jeff, to put a little finer point on it, I did hear you say that when the traffic signals are at the end of their life and would be replaced, that the, the conversion would happen at that time. Is that right? Yeah, that, that to us, that's the logical nexus. So if this project isn't in this current five-year CIP, do you have any sense of how or when we would know that that would hit? Uh, I would I would guess, and I'll ask Jason and Ron and Scott there to, to jump in if they disagree, but I'm guessing we're looking at five to 10 years um, with, with the age of those signals. Is that okay assumption for the engineering crew there? I think that's a good assumption, Jeff. I guess I would just add that I, I think there there are legitimate issues with the, the north side businesses. It's tougher to to support these small businesses when when it's hard when it's harder to get there and you have to and you have to drive around. We're trying to we're trying to reduce car traffic. Um, and but backing up a little bit and and also referring to what Mayor Pro Tem did, we're going to have uh, enormous um, chunk of money coming our way that I that I think we're going to all take want to take a, a really good look at coming from the American Rescue Plan, um, and that that may not address the street, but I think it can it can address some other things such as um, among others affordable housing. So I'm not. I'm not personally concerned that we're not going to have the opportunity within the next year or so to really make an impact there. So I wanted to um, kind of get a sense of where people are on, on this um, as far as staff direction. So it sounds like Councilor Burgess, I know that you want a clarification or so, about the conversion and the traffic lights. Um, are you in a, is your position to kind of wait until that takes place? I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, I'm not asking that it be put in, put back in, in the near term. Okay. And then I support the staff too. Okay. And is there anyone else that supports staff? I, I you know, to and I guess I can. I, I, in this situation, I think when I look at the two point six million to convert, um, the traffic lights are going to be happening um, five to ten years. One question that I do have is. When we do the conversion, is this more paint on the street or does that actually involve the changing of some of the roads, widening, shortening, essentially digging up the road? <laughs> yeah, Ron, why don't you field that one or Jason? I think for the most part, the pavement would stay the same in between intersections. There may be some work at the intersections to address the, the radius returns and curb ramps and that kind of stuff. But for the most part, the pavement between intersections would remain consistent with what it is today. We may look at reallocating that similar to what we're doing with the, widening the bike lanes, but I think as far as total curb to curb width, we'd be about the same. Okay. Um, I, I did wanna also um, point out or maybe seek some clarification um, I understand that the staff is supportive of this, just kind of down the road. You know, uh, Councillor Thomas made great points when it came down to the one-way, two-way conversions. Is there a greater plan to look at all of our one-way streets and try to convert them? And 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 I heard Councillor Mims, you know, bring up some points about, um, you know, that having a one-way or two-way conversion west of Clinton Street, those are concerning, right? You you know, those are steep hills, absolutely. Um, of course, my mind was trying to figure out a solution uh, on the snow days, you know, do we go out and do some cones and only have one-way traffic coming up Jefferson Street, you know, <laughs> I don't know. But, but yeah, I, that is concerning, right? Those are steep hills, but um, is there a plan for 
one-way to two-way uh, conversions throughout our entire community. Yeah, and uh, I see Kent Ralston on the on the call. Ken, if you could help me with this one. Well, Kent's getting ready. Um, I do I do want to make it clear for those you know listening. We have done one-way, two-way conversions um, in recent years. Uh, we've done them in the downtown. Uh, it wasn't too long ago where Washington Street was was one way. Um, and we've, we've uh, continued to look at that. We've been pretty aggressive as, as this council knows with, with other roadway design changes with four to three lane conversions as well that have been tough projects in the community, but we've, we've forged ahead on those. We continue to do that. I think the guiding plan that comes to mind for me before I turn it over to Kent is, is the bicycle master plan. A lot of those projects were identified in that, uh, that effort. Kent, can you add on to that? Yeah, I can. So I was sitting here uh, trying to actually think about how many one-way streets we had left in town. Uh, Jeff did mention, you know, we we, we recently changed Governor and Dodge, um, both south of Burlington. In fact, Dodge just finished up this year. Uh, the downtown street, certainly, uh, we changed Washington a few years back. Um, if and when we get to Market and Jefferson, uh, the only main one-way roads I can think of that would be left in town are Dodge and Governor North of Burlington, which are also part of the highway system, part of the state highway system. So that presents some challenges that we'll have to work through if and when we ever get to that point. Um, the other one way that I can think of currently would be down around the county administration building uh, around Benton and Dubuque and Clinton. And I believe uh, the current thinking is that it, when some of those properties redevelop in that area, the city carton property and some others, that we would look at also sort of unwinding those one that one way loop that currently exists that's a little awkward and I think that's the time we would we would look to get rid of those. Um, with Mark with uh, Jefferson market I did want to mention too we haven't talked about level of service a lot. And when we did the actual traffic study back in 2015 2016 um, certainly there was a lot of good points uh, made by Council and others tonight that I won't argue. Uh, I do just want to mention that when it comes down to actual level of service for bikes, pedestrians, and vehicles, the actual study showed it was pretty much a wash. So there are certainly other benefits to that, but when it comes down to the actual level of service, I don't think we're going to see any um, really great improvements when we make that with respect to how long it takes a vehicle, uh, bike, or pedestrian to travel those corridors or cross those corridors for that matter. So just wanted to point that out as well, but um, yeah, I think I think the the bigger goal, Mayor, is to to look at all these corridors and and eventually get rid of all our one ways. It's just sort of a matter of time. And then, of course, working with the state if we ever get to uh, Governor and Dodge, which will be a little bit of a challenge. Is there any plans, Kent, to kind of um, you know have have this planned out, uh, you know, from you all, and even including the you know the when you reach out to the state about North Dodge? Sure, so like I said, I think the, the area down around the county administration building will work itself out, I think, when those properties uh, turn. I think that's the idea there. And when we put in the extension of Capitol Street, uh, which is in the Riverfront um, Crossings Master Plan. Um, Market and Jefferson, of course, we're talking about tonight. And then Dodge and Governor, I, I don't have a, an outlook on the time frame for that. Um, that gets into how those roads are funded as well. And I would have to defer to, to the city manager on that and the, the engineering folks. But if and when we ever convert those, if the state would not allow it and we did it anyway, they would be more than happy to allow us to do it. But then we would also own those streets, which we share funding for those now. Um, Dodge Street reconstruction is in your CIP here in a few years. Uh, it's something like a 10 plus million dollar project. And of course, the DOT will be paying for roughly half of that, uh, I think, when the time comes. But if we were to ever uh, gain jurisdiction of those roadways, they would be ours uh, to pay for in perpetuity. So I, I don't know how that conversation will go, Mayor, but that's certainly a conversation that, that will have to be had when, when we get to that point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it sounds like, you know, staff is on board with one way to, one way to two-way conversions um, in, in general. I, I won't, you know, say that is across the board, but in general. Yeah, so I, at least for staff direction, um, there's a majority of council that doesn't support moving forward with this. And um, and I have to agree with Mayor Pro Tem when she mentioned that the road conditions, there are worse roads than um, 
that are out there right now that we can be spending $2.6 million if there wasn't any type of plan for this, um, for a conversion uh, for the Jefferson governor, then, you know, or Jefferson market, I'm sorry, then there might be, I, I might have a different position, but as of now, um, I don't support any change. So it sounds like there's a majority of council that don't support the change. And so um, there's no uh, direction to staff to do anything different. Um, Mayor, as you transition to the next item, I, I, for those listening, I, I wanna make sure that uh, folks know we're, we're still committed to that downtown streetscape plan. Um, we've invested quite a bit uh, in follow-up to that plan. When you think of Washington Street reconstruction, the Ped Mall reconstruction, uh, and and uh, a lot of smaller projects that surround that. Your CIP also has the Dubuque Street reconstruction between Iowa and Washington, which will be a very significant uh, project, much like Washington was a few years ago. So we are continuing to work on that plan. Uh, we do feel like it's a it's a good guidebook for us. And um, Market Jefferson's still a still a key piece to that. But much like Clinton Street and Lynn Street and 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 the many others that are there. Um, it's just for, for staff, at least right now, uh, it's not the, not the highest priority, but uh, hopefully we'll get to it and we'll get to it. And, and soon, uh, we'll make sure, uh, to, to take another look at it with, with next year's CIP. And, uh, we'll, we'll make sure on the public work side that as we do, uh, uh, signal checks and inspections that as that date gets closer when we know that we're going to have some that, that the engineering's ready to go for the conversion piece so uh, there won't be whole much uh, a whole lot of delay there great if nothing else we'll move on to the next item which is explore tax amendments to facilitate more neighborhood commercial in residential areas and that's in the same um, ip of april 1st ip4 in the information packet. All right, Jeff, you wanna take this away? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, this is um, an item that's been hanging out there since you created your strategic plan uh, about a year ago. Um, uh, we're really just looking for some council discussion here. Um, we're not expecting you to, to be able to articulate exact code changes that you'd like to see, but we really didn't have a chance during the strategic planning effort to get uh, too detailed in our discussions. Um, but this centers around the idea that the council would like to see some smaller neighborhood nodes in and around residential areas. Um, uh, you know, those, those walkable neighborhood commercial centers that, uh, um, uh, that, that residents would, would really benefit from. Um, we do have several examples of those, uh, probably to, to um, varying degrees of success. Um, Certainly the area that we just talked about on the north side is looked at as a very um, kind of uh, very successful uh, neighborhood commercial node. Um, we also have smaller uh, neighborhood um, centers, uh, for example, like Old Town Village uh, on the east side that, that is walkable from a number of different areas out there. Um, council's aware that earlier this year, we presented some code changes that you approved that would help facilitate more infill of existing uh, commercial nodes, and, and some of that is going to help uh, su surrounding neighborhoods. You can think of the North Dodge coffee shop example that, that we brought to you. That certainly has a good residential base around it. Um, so there's been a little bit of progress on this item, um, but really wanted just a chance for you to articulate which, which, which you would like to see more of in the community so that we could give some critical thought to, to code changes that might be needed to, uh, to facilitate that. And the last thing I'll mention is uh, you're, you're well aware that we're working on the form-based code for the South District. There is a neighborhood commercial district uh, that uh, uh, is part of that code proposal that we'll be bringing to the Planning and Zoning Commission and to you here shortly. And, and so as we think of new greenfield developments, whether it's South District or West or East, uh, when we apply this form-based code, we will have, we believe, the tools in place to, to, to really facilitate that type of development. So I'd encourage you to think more on infill opportunities um, than Greenfield, because I think the Greenfield solution will be coming your way and we'll, we can have a discussion on that in the future. Do 
Jeff, I was wondering if um, there's been any outreach uh, to like the neighborhood association in particular, like the South District Association, they meet pretty frequently and like asking for input from them on, on what they feel their neighborhood might need for some commercial areas. So I'm very much in favor of this. And we have some very, as you'd mentioned, some very successful neighborhood commercial. And then we have the few that were grandfathered in the Tomas meat market over there off in Muscatine has been very successful. And it's in the heart of a very walkable single family neighborhood. And, and of course there's the wonderful deluxe bakery uh, that also was grandfathered in uh, uh, because it had been commercial prior and, and it's just very successful also. Uh, there's always someone there, a very busy place and uh, in the heart again of a single family neighborhood. So I'm very much in favor of those kinds of things, but looking around and driving up and down that highway one six quarter and there, there are some vacant buildings, uh, but I was just wondering and I was looking when I looked into neighborhood commercial, it listed, you know, things like convenience stores and, you know, those banks and, and it's going up and down that corridor. We, we've, we've got uh, an abundance of, of those kinds of things in that area, pizza places and banks and convenience stores. But one thing that I did not see and we should maybe try to encourage more of, uh, uh, we're, we're lacking daycare. Uh, I would like to see that and I would hope and I would think that that's probably what these uh, residents would, would say is that they, they need some form of daycare over on that side of town. Yeah, good good comments there. That's helpful. Um, we have not done any outreach. Probably, I would I would guess the last time we did any type of related outreach would be uh, the last time we updated comprehensive plan, whether that's the the entire umbrella comprehensive plan that we have or or district comp plans is probably the last time we did targeted outreach on this subject. I guess personally, I, I think having uh, commercial opportunities throughout the you know neighborhoods is 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 a good idea. One of the concerns that I have, of course, um, is the neighbors <laughs> that that may complain if there is some type of a business that it has a lot of foot traffic. Uh, we could anticipate that there would be some people that would complain about that. It's, it's, a, it's a different use. They didn't buy their house to have, you know, all this foot traffic and uh, all the parking spaces in front of their house taken up. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I support the idea of commercial spaces. Um, I, I think it makes a lot of sense, um, you know, it, to explore. But I, I can hear some, you know, just neighbors coming forth with with complaints, um, substantiated or not. Most times, well, whatever would be going there that is commercial wouldn't even be there yet. So it, it would all be assumptions made by neighbors how that one business will change their neighborhood and and, and make it feel different. So. I, I'm all about commercial spaces being in residential areas. Um, I, I think that's just something that we have to consider. Mayor, that's a very excellent point and I forgot I was going to bring that up. Uh, we did have that situation a while back uh, when Paul's left uh, their, their building and uh, the neighbors are obviously missing Paul's but the, the business that went in there, no fault of their own, uh, had bright lights, brighter lights than what Paul's ever did. And they, uh, right behind them, uh, to the north of them, was a residential neighborhood, an older residential neighborhood with not much screening uh, for trees or fences or anything. So the bright lights shone right into there. So not necessarily the foot tra traffic, uh, Mayor, but those sort of uh, unanticipated things like the lighting and the noise, perhaps. Then I think there's, I hear you both, and I think those things are solvable too through good neighbor meetings and working with the community. Um, there's, we're always going to encounter when there are new uses or new things come in, a certain amount of nimbyism um, and people, and, it, and change is hard. But if we're looking at, at um, walkable communities, things that we can, that people can get to that they don't need a car to get to, um, then small, businesses, groceries, coffee shops, whatever whatever we can encourage, I think are great as infill. The question is, are they viable as businesses? One other thing that I did want to mention is for, um, you know, these commercial spaces and neighborhoods, 
there is somewhat of an equity where um, my assumption is that the properties would then be charged commercial taxes. Is that correct, potentially? If you're thinking about the examples that were given with the, the meat uh, market and, and deluxe, then yes, those would be commercial. Um, not necessarily the same for, for like a home-based business um, type of operation that already takes place in neighborhoods. Um, so depends on the degree. If you're thinking coffee shops and daycares, then yes. Uh, what about a clothing store? Yeah, I would think that that's gonna be commercial. That's going to be okay. So, and the only reason I bring that up is um, when I think about just some of our minorities, you know, within the community, if they want to get into um, having their, you know, renting a, a, a property just for commercial commercial use, uh, some of that could be a little cost preventative, you know, prohibitive. But um, I at least wanted to make mention that, you know, it. it we probably should keep in mind what type of businesses will be will be charged commercial versus not be very clear and we probably already have that um, but we just want to be cognizant that um, you know someone may already have a little small business that they want to take it to a next level and rent a space for um, commercial um, and the revenue may not be that great you know, starting out. So just wanted to at least make mention that whatever we're doing, let's put on our equity lens as well. Thanks for that uh, comment, Mayor. I was gonna just ask Jeff, I think in the memo, this really was directed towards the, the more pure commercial uses, I guess is how I read it. Um, just off the top of your head, I mean, the home-based business, there's some flexibility there if you if you reside in the place where you're. I mean, there's certain activities that are allowed in in homes. I wonder if maybe um, an educational campaign relating to some of that might be useful, so that people understand what they can do in their in their residence um, versus if they had a, you know property that was really only used for commercial purposes. Want yeah, hear? we can we can definitely promote some of that. And um, Anne, I see you're on the call. Uh, if you've got more information on this, let me know. But generally, your home-based businesses, you can think of a, uh, someone that does an in-home daycare, which the city's actively funded and supported workforce development in that area to, to promote um, in-home daycares. That's something that can take place in, in your own home. Um, you have you, you probably have a lot of people in the community that may make something and sell it out of their, sell it out of their home. You know, maybe someone's making jewelry and selling it online. Uh, you know, that, that type of business generally works good for an in-home type of use. Um, where we start to, where we start to draw that line is, is um, what the mayor brought up earlier, which is foot traffic. You know, how many people are coming and going? What does the parking look like? Um, what are those other effects on the community? Um, probably, you know, a common one that cities struggle with, um, I'm not necessarily that, that I could point to here, but there's a, a lot of people um, that might try to do a car repair business in their own driveway. And then, you know, you occasionally hear complaints about disabled cars on the, on the roadway, or just the, the, the noise and the negative uh, aspects of, of doing that mechanic style work in a residential area. That's a, that's a common one that cities struggle with that would be you know, borderline in, in, incompatible in a lot of different areas, depending on how large that, you know, that operation grew to be. Um, and I think that is the, you know, that is the struggle is finding that line. I think, you know, a lot of people like that idea of, of a, a morning bakery that they can walk to and, and have coffee at. Um, but if you're asked to think of five or six other uses that may fit, um, it, you may be hard pressed to, to, to do that. And, that's that's where it gets tricky in writing writing code and 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 trying to make some allowances. I think what you've seen in the past is, like the coffee shop example, when we have a good proposal like that that fits, we analyze our code, we try to figure out how to make that project work, and we tend to do it in a narrow way so that it doesn't have negative uh, unintended consequences. 
some some of my thoughts on this would be in, in the matrix uh, that kind of covers the the types of commercial zones we have. Some of them do not allow residential, and uh, in terms of the the kind of the concept of the suburban retrofit uh, in commercial areas that are struggling, uh, and they have large parking lots. Uh, some have seen the introduction of residential development, partly to give kind of a mixed use uh, component, uh, which is in inherently walkable. So you have more people living nearby who can then use that commercial district. So that's certainly one thing um, that could be considered or assessed as to whether there, there's a, an opportunity for that, that type of retrofit. Um, other commercial districts, and we've seen it on in Northside Marketplace, is the creation of a, of a public space. The closure of, of Lynn Street between Market and the alleyway there, I would say has been the most significant move in that, in that neighborhood commercial district since, well, in the last 10 years. Um, so it's people are very excited about having that come back, at least the people that, that I've been talking to. That, that's something that the downtown has uh, as well. So, you know, try, trying to see how that could be replicated in some of our other uh, commercial districts uh, would be something to think about. Um, in terms of the greenfield, I do think the, this, the, the vision that we should try to uh, you know, create, uh, accomplish would be the idea that uh, we are creating a small town. So you have that same level of um, mixed use, walkability. There are lots of moving parts that go into achieving that. Uh, it's not just missing middle, it's not, not 10 foot lanes. I mean, all of those things play into it, but it's, it's a really a, a complete picture made up of a lot of elements. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that say in the Carson Farm, that's what we see uh, is the creation of a viable mixed use uh, place, which has the, the feeling of a, either a small Iowa town or an urban, um, an urban neighborhood like the North side, where, which has its own mixed use components. Um, what the other interesting thing I think is that we've seen a lot of uh, with COVID, and I think it will stay with us, is many people are, are at home working virtually now. So it's almost like we've brought, uh, without any significant impacts on the neighborhood, more people uh, in the neighborhood all week long. And if you create, so there it's, you know, people are staying home now instead of commuting to work somewhere else. So there, there's a larger population uh, who is interested in things close by. Uh, so if we provide those things and make it easy to get to them, um, that that should help revitalization. I mean, I think certainly in the north side, you know, those those of us who are working at home now, um, really the thought of being able to go to North Side Marketplace as an outdoor public space is very inviting. That that could also be replicated. And I think there are more people um, who will be interested in, in having those sorts of opportunities, either within walking or bicycle, uh, bike distance. Um, you know, there's a concept that I think Iowa City is really set up well to achieve, and that is the idea that either by walking or bicycling, you can pretty much um, access all that you would you need in your life. Uh, within 15 minutes. So that just simply means making sure we have, uh, you know, that bicycle network, uh, safe streets to walk, pleasant walk, comfortable walk, um, connecting us from our homes to the nearest commercial neighborhood district. So uh, I think there are some great opportunities, um, both in the short and the long term, in terms of, uh, you know, creating more, more vibrant, um, uh, neighborhood commercial areas uh, that also uh, generate more taxable value because some of these auto-oriented um, commercial districts are, are really 
I would say underperforming. Um, and, and I think there's an opportunity to turn them around. Jeff, how often do do potential businesses come to the city with a with a location that's in a residential neighborhood and just essentially at that first step or first inquiry get turned away because the idea of, you know, I guess they would have to rezone, right? And the and the the concept of rezoning within a residential zone just isn't is kind of a non-starter. So they just get turned away. Does that happen often? Do we have examples? I mean, not necessarily specific businesses, but like, is that something that happens at the staff level? I certainly don't um, hear many requests at all uh, for for that. Um, um, and if you if you feel those, please jump in and uh, let me know. Um, but no, I don't think we I don't think we get a ton of those requests. Um, it's not just the compatibility with a with necessarily the um, the the neighborhood, but it's also there, there's difference in code, you know, building code um, requirements when you start to get into a commercial venture that uh, could make conversion of a residential space uh, a lot more difficult. I would just add, this is Ann Russett with Neighborhood and Development Services. That since I've been here, I think for three years. Um, I received two inquiries of businesses that wanted to locate it to, in a residential zone. Well, I'll just add. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll just add that I, I personally came before council in two thousand and six, and requested um, a zone into a commercial. Uh, right next door to Linsing Funeral Home, a house there. And I was denied, so I know the feeling about being denied. But um, I did want to maybe just add uh, and ask Anne about any accessibility uh, concerns or um, is, is that something that typically goes into um, consideration for the conversion? I think in the inquiries that I received, they were proposing a use that was not allowed in the zone. Okay. So it was it was really a function of of our residential zones not allowing very many non-residential uses. Sure, okay, I'm done. To me, the issue, it, and I don't know that I can give any clear direction as staff requested at the end of the memo, but when I think of you know businesses and commercial in a residential area, um, the idea of having businesses and amenities there that people can walk or bike to are just great. Um, I think the viability of very many of those in this day and age, unfortunately, is probably pretty limited. Um, you, you don't have a whole lot of people that can come in and do what Jamie Powers did with the deluxe bakery. Um, not to say there are others, but it, those are the exceptions, not, not real common. And so um, people, unfortunately, are still going to be, you know, getting in their cars and driving across town or, you know, to the grocery store or to the hardware store. And, you know, we've got a nice one on the north side, et cetera. But it, it's finding businesses, it, it's trying to remove roadblocks from people who do have an idea for a business that could work well in the residential without having a negative impact on the life of people in that neighborhood. So in other words, not creating an excessively large amount of foot traffic or vehicular traffic or noise or odors, things like that. To me, if those are not factors, then why not let the business be in the residential area, as long as it's not having that negative impact on the neighborhood. So I, I don't know if that really helps staff, but when I think about trying to open things up for more business in those residential, it's like, yeah, anything that's not going to have that excessive volume of traffic, excessive noise, smells, or anything else that would deteriorate from the quality of life in the neighborhood.
I, I agree with that. I don't, again, Jeff, thanks for saying it's not up to us to figure out the how, but when we think about what, what the differential between commercial and residential zones is, you know, I think we're trying to control or buffer for those things that, that Susan was mentioning, the traffic, the hours of operation, right, lights, sounds, smells, parking, um, so, so yeah, if there's a way to address those concerns, and I guess for the couple that are the non-conforming but legal uses, that's still, is that still like a pretty intensive case by case process where you would figure out, you know, all those elements as it goes? I mean, if there was some way to, if there was some way to implement like that, that sort of um, review that you would have, you know, for any business that would want to locate in what would otherwise be a residential area so that you could address all of those factors. And it's not like a, you know, use by right for any type of business. Um, I guess one thought I have on that is with the legal non-conforming situations, we don't have a lot of we have a handful of commercial uses within residential zones. I don't think it comes up that often where we're analyzing whether or not um, there's a legal non-conforming situation. So I don't think it's I don't think it's very time intensive because um, it's it's not that frequent. Yeah, I guess I was just imagining, is there some process, like some evaluative process that could occur if someone inquired, hey, can I do this in my neighborhood, um, you know, that, that would be on a more case-by-case -case basis? I, I think what you're talking about is some kind of special exception process. I mean, the, the code would have to define what the, you know, what the availability of the special exception would have to be put in the code, but then it would be the Board of Adjustment that would impact, for instance, the effect on the neighborhood, et cetera. Thank you, Eleanor. And just one, one thing that um, Councillor Thomas raised that I wanted to make sure, based on your memo, Jeff, it looks like that residential, like multifamily is allowed in most commercial zones, just not in the intensive or um, highway commercial district. So individuals could come in with like a mixed housing and commercial development now in something that is a most of our commercial zones is that right and you want to take that yeah. sure um that's true i would just say that in most of our commercial zones that we have a requirement that the first floor of any building has to be commercial so if you're thinking about redeveloping um, kind of a strip mall, which I think Council Member Thomas was talking about, to incorporate any residential uses, they have to be above the first floor. Okay, thank you. So, Jeff, did you did you get what you needed? <laughs> I, I think we have enough to kind of further our staff discussions on it. So it's it's been helpful to hear this and. There's a, a couple of different thoughts that we'll uh, we'll take from here and we'll we'll come back to you if we need some more guidance or if we want to bounce some ideas off you. All right, great. We are on to clarification of agenda items. Mayor, I don't know if this is the right time, but I think we talked about um, resetting a work session for going over the preliminary plan restructure of the police. And I think we looked at dates and then we're going to reschedule that, but it, is that still hanging out there? It is. Okay. Just want to make sure we don't lose track of it. Yep. Yep. It, it didn't sound like a work, a special work session in April was going to be possible uh, for all seven. So we either need to get that scheduled on a regular work session agenda or look towards May. Can we then, um, I do wonder if our next, 
I can't recall some of the things that we have lingering for our next work session. Um, for the next one, uh, staff is preparing to have a COVID related discussion with you. I don't know that that'll take the whole time, but wanted to get your thoughts uh, uh, re in regards to some of our reopening um, um, plans and uh, as well as give you a chance to um, talk about uh, uh, going back to in-person meetings and what, what that would look like as well. So, so we're busy pulling that together uh, and would hope to have that in the April 15th information packet so it could be discussed on the 20th. Mm -hmm. um, we could, I, I guess my assumption is we could potentially do it on the 20th. It's, it seemed like we should probably get it done sooner than later, start start the conversation. Um, and then, that, so that would be the next, the next work session if people are in agreement with that. Mayor, I can't remember, did we, um, were we waiting to get some of the feedback that, that we were outsourcing? to be prepared for that work session. I guess I wasn't in necessarily a super hurry. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't falling off the radar. Yeah, you know, we haven't um, we haven't started with that outreach as we as we started to explore that. I think the the feeling was that it would be much more um, beneficial uh, to to wait until we could do more in-person meetings um, uh, to to gather that feedback, so we were we we're hoping to initiate that uh, uh, here late spring and summer. Um, really, with the preliminary plan, it's a little bit different than the CPRB and the OIR report. R really, what what I'm looking for, and and for some of these, you're going to say we want more input on this before we before we go. Um, I'm kind of looking for that direction on what what do you really want to see input on, and what. Does staff have a green light to start working on? And you know, I'll give you a couple of examples. Would would be you know the idea of working to expand the local mo mobile crisis program, the, working to begin 911 uh, integration discussions countywide. I hate to have that linger too long. I'd like to get to work on that, but I also feel like I need that permission from you because there may be other approaches to. Um, uh, those those issues that, that you want to take, or perhaps you want to wait till there's public input. So it's not going to be necessarily yes or no to all these items. It's going to be staff can proceed ahead and begin planning on this, and we should really hold off and 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 wait on uh, on these other items. Yep, and and I just want to at least make the point that we're actually talking about IP. Um, information part packet for March 18th. I had I had thought uh, along the police the preliminary plan that there was some discussion. Maybe I'm making this up, but some discussion about needing the staff direction on the interstate access um, as being something that needed to be done sooner rather than later. I have a memory that when I was asked for the, the, um, the memo that I'm working on on First Amendment activity within the protest context was kind of during that discussion. Yeah, I think that, that ties back to the OIR um, report there. So I think you're right, Eleanor. When, okay, when right. that legal analysis is done, we'll need, to, we'll need to jump in and have that discussion. Okay. We just wanted to make sure my memo was not right on target. So I guess what I would ask the council is, uh, does it seem reasonable that the 20th we start the conversation? My idea is saying that anything that you need the public and vote, we have to wait for it. I don't know why we're in hurry, but if there is something that staff need us to talk about it and that doesn't need a public input. We can just talk about those things so we can give them direction to start. But I just believe that we should wait for more public input. I, I, 
I think I once know. we go through the, because the staff kind of categorize and color things, um, some, you know, do, do can they get the green light to start working on doing some research? So I do think that as we go through there, we'll be able to identify as a council, either what our plans are for the public, you know, engagement. Um, but I do feel, I mean, this has been out since December that we do need to have a conversation. This is a and I would agree that there are some things. Yeah, I, I do agree that there are some things that the public, you know, we should, you know, get their input on. I think as we're going through the items, I think we'll be able to decide that as a group. I don't want to just like agree on something and after that we hear feedback from the public and we say, oh, we should have just waited for that or this. I don't know. Would we have um, Eleanor's memo by the 20th that we could talk about that? If that's my my be plan is to put that memo out before this, you know, the, the week of the 16th, right before I leave. I mean, I'm working with, Sue so will know what I'm doing. Um, so she can respond to questions and stuff. But that has been my plan is to try and get that out to you uh, before I leave. The, the other, I mean, the other option is if we were to um, have a, just a work session only, uh, we can potentially do a work session if people can maybe give me some assessment um, the week of the 26th when when we need to maybe we can then have a discussion um, that week for one the applications or we can just keep that for the fourth for the uh, attorney applications um, but then we can go into a work session the week of the 26th so if there's a you know, something that people can identify the week of the 26th. And if I uh, remember what we did was we went on Tuesday, the 20th, uh, um, we went on a Tuesday and I want to say we started at 3 p.m. So I don't know what people thoughts are for Tuesday, the 27th at 3 p.m. where we can just do a, a work session. So, and maybe we just have just that on our agenda and You mean we just to start our work session one hour early? That's what you think? No, um, it will be the week of the twenty seventh. I'm uh, the week I'm of the twenty sixth. Not that week. You're not available that week. Okay. So then it would just be the either the twentieth or we can do it on the fourth. So what do we have on the fourth, Jeff? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I'd have to. I'd have to spend some time and look at look at what we have. Um, maybe it's something that uh, I can I can talk to the mayor, Mayor Pro Tem about in in the coming weeks. Um, you know, we also maybe needing to schedule a, a discussion um, on the recovery funds that 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 the city's been allocated once some of those treasury guidance documents come out so I, I could see that sneaking up on us and and taking some time on the fourth but um maybe in another week or two we'll have some more clarity on on a couple of these uh outstanding issues what i might propose is because I, I i would agree i think um that recovery uh we need to spend some time there so what i might suggest is that um i'll put one more thing out there um can is, are people available on Tuesday the 11th of May at 3 p.m.? And if we don't get consensus now, then I'll just have um, Hallie reach out to us. <laughs> I'm free on. So looking at May 11th at 3 p.m. I could. I'm open up that day. It's okay. It's right. It's right before Eid, Maz. Does that impact you? I mean, Eid is on the twelfth. 
you're on mute, Mayor Pro Tem. I, I was just thinking about that, but but let me see my, I'm opening my calendar. One second, please. All right. But thank you, Yanis, you always remember this. Okay. Yeah, I, I can do it. it how long going to be? I think we should at least plan for two hours. OK, then. I'm for it. OK. All right. Look like we have consensus. Everybody is about Burgess, are you, you said yes. OK. All right. All right, so we'll, we'll do it that day. Anything else? Well, let's uh, formal agenda. Anything else from there? Well, I guess we, we're actually at March. Let's stay with March 18th IP. Anything else from that IP? Mayor, while we're on schedule here, can I just mention one, one more thing? Um, so the other kind of major assignment I need to have before I leave is to uh, address the CPRB recommend proposals for changes to the ordinance. Um, and I'm, I'm starting to work on that, but I think that's going to have to hold until we get through the legislative session. Um, there's some bills um, that are going through that, that look like pretty likely may become law and they're going to influence what we can and can't do with, with the CPRB, I think. So I think we need to wait until that's done to, to do that. Yeah, that that's, should be drawing to, to an end by the end of this month. They're working on, they're working on budget now. If they go past the end of, uh, of April, then they don't get per diem. So they don't want to stay. <laughs> we'll just do what we can do before I leave, but I won't put that out before I leave. Okay, understandable. So, so we'll follow up with that. Yep. I'm saying shaking heads of we understand. Yes. All right. Anything else with um, info packet March 9th, 18th? Um, I just wanted to point out the really the the really thorough um, pl work plan from the Historic Preservation Commission. That it's uh, I I found it really worthwhile going through and really helpful to to see how they want to integrate essentially climate and a lot of other things into their work as well, as well as racial justice. Right. Anything else? March 25th. April 1st. Okay, hearing nothing else. Any updates on assignment boards, commissions, and committees? I know we've been doing stuff. <laughs> I used to be a little more organized with my my calendar I had to pull it up, but huh, that's gone by the wayside. <laughs> Well, we, we had a meeting of the Jack, and now I can't even remember what we did, which is really terrible to say. <laughs> but Susan, do, do you recall offhand what we what we did? Uh, yeah, there's an issue. There's an issue with our contract um, for the radios that's being changed. We just hadn't been able to get a bid from one of the companies, so that'll probably be changing. Um, the budget's all set. That really is about all. We did have a meeting of the MPO. Uh, most all of us were also at that and a uh, major thing was uh, approval of streets projects that uh, Iowa City had presented. Uh, so that was a good thing. Uh, the other was the uh, federal swap, federal aid swap program came up yet again and was again, uh, our group uh, voted to opt out of that program. Hearing nothing else, then we are adjourned until our formal meeting 
um, within about 20 minutes, which will start at 6 p.m. And that is a different Zoom and I'll see you all there.